So last but not least is the exotic three-point perspective. I'm not going to go into great depth on it, except to just introduce it to you and say that it is a useful skill to have in your arsenal, even if you just think about it. I don't use it a lot. I don't know if that's fair to say. I use it pretty often, but not all the time. What a three-point perspective is and where it comes into play is if you're standing somewhere and you see enormous height either above you or below you. The best way to describe it, I think, is if you are in the great north woods or the, the redwood forest and they're so majestic and you look up and the tops of the trees seem to converge because they're so far away from you. The bottoms of the trees can look fairly far apart, but as you look up, because they're so far away, they begin to close in and look tighter and closer at the top. And that is just perspective turned on its side. Um, I have some examples here, a couple I wanted to show you. I don't know how well this will show up on camera, but I was in Chicago in the Willis Tower looking out the observatory and you look down, you know, hundreds of feet down into the city streets and you can see that the buildings appear, the bottoms of the buildings appear much closer to each other than the tops do. And of course, that's because of the enormous distance from where I was standing, the horizon way up here hundreds of feet in the air, looking down on the busy city streets, the bottoms of the buildings appear to get closer and closer. Um, here's just one quick example of a, a painting I did along those lines. It's a very sort of impressionistic view looking from a window in New York down on the busy city streets at night you can see that the angles of the building appear to converge down low in the painting. And that's true. If I were standing on the sidewalk, looking up, the tops of the buildings would seem to converge. So the principle holds no matter which way you're looking. Is this ever a useful thing for the watercolorist? Sure. Or painter in general? Absolutely, um, but it can be overdone and it could look a little forced sometimes. I think it's just a useful tool to have in your tool belt to, uh, to think about using sometimes. I don't know if you guys remember the old days where we used to take rolls of film into the whatever my mom dropped them off and they, they'd come back and you'd look at these goofy little photographs. Everything we saw, the edges of the photos tended to curve in around the edges. It's really the way our eyes see. And our brain compensates for that by making vertical lines appear vertical in the world around us when they're really not. Uh, if you think about it, you can drive yourself a little nuts, but in the corner of your eyes and your peripheral vision, things do tend to curve in. A little. That's in a sense um, three point perspective at play, but never mind. So, why is it called three point? Well, turn this upside down. Let's just say you're here. You're standing next to a very large building, for lack of a better example. The closer corner to you of that building will appear to be vertical. You'll see a little bit of the left side, a little bit of the right side. And if it were a normal sized, a more normal sized height building, 
you can get the very understandable two-point perspective thing happening. Here's your horizon. The bottoms of the bottom of the building appears to slope up to meet the horizon there at the left on the right. The bottom appears to slope up to meet the horizon here on the left. And if this were, say, just a three or four story building, you would imagine the top to be about there and that would look all well and good. But if this is an enormous building, a hundred stories or something, then the building starts to appear to slope in at the top. The whole thing, the top of the building looks so far away and the angles are so acute I want to reiterate, this doesn't just happen with man-made or architectural elements. It happens with clouds, obviously with large trees, anything that's really far away, elements of the landscape. So the third point is if you would extend the lines of the converging sides of the building, in this case, way up into space, they would eventually converge, meet, right here on the axis of the nearest point of that building, the vertical point, to form a third point perspective way up into space. Is it ever necessary to absolutely locate that point? Maybe, but very rarely. Generally, when I sketch or paint in three-point, uh, I do just wing it. I know that it happens, so I just add a little curvature or uh, foreshortening to the tops of very tall buildings, and usually that's enough to imply. There's no, rarely any real reason to actually locate that exact point because it's almost always so very far away from you that it would be difficult to do so. There are technical ways of doing it, that if you're a super perspective nerd, um, I could talk to you about, but I can say it's almost never worth it. It's just knowing that it happens can be useful. But another reminder, here we're standing looking up at a very tall building. Here, if you flip it upside down, and compare it to this view I did of a very, of a view from a very tall window in New York, the effect is the same if you're looking from up, down on something. So if you were at the top of a large tree looking down at the forest floor, the bottoms of the trees would tend to converge. Whereas here you're in a city, the bottoms of the buildings tend to converge. So it's just a perspective tool that you can think about using. It's very fun to play around with and it can give you on occasion some really exciting and dynamic views that wouldn't be available to you if you didn't know a little bit about how to use it. I don't think I want to go much further into three-point perspectives because they're not really often that, not used all that often but I just wanted to introduce it today. And uh, as the course goes on, if there are questions that come up about this, I'm really happy to go into much greater detail for anybody who's interested. So that is it for our perspective lesson. I hope, uh, I hope you got something out of it. And uh, I hope you find it not, again, technically boring or pedantic, but I hope you understand my intent, which is to make perspective accessible, usable, and an artistic tool for you to, uh, you know, to wield, to make your paintings easier, smoother, and much more enjoyable. As far as an assignment for this uh, perspective lesson, I would like to give one. Um, I'd like you guys to look at something. It doesn't have to be an element of architecture. Could be. It could be a house. It could be a room. 
an interior view or an exterior view, or you could just take um, a book or a bottle or something very simple, put it on your desk, and I'd like you to do a sketch of it in uh, a one point and then in a two point perspective. I think um, you can be as fancy and as intricate as you'd like to be, but I just think what that'll help teach you if you don't already grasp it is how different a story a one-point perspective tells than a more angular two-point perspective can tell. Even though, even though they're of the same subject, the same object, the story, the feeling can be wildly different just by turning your viewpoint a little this way or that. Uh, the world always looks a little different from a different angle, and that's the whole point. So anyway, thank you guys for bearing with me for this. I love perspective. I could go on and on, but I think those are the main points. And once again, um, through the site, I'm sure I can answer any more in-depth questions anybody has or any clarity anybody might need on what we talked about today.